kicking off this this brand new series called He Shall Be Called. And uh, we're going to be springboarding out of the book of Isaiah, chapter 9. Um, we'll get to that in just a moment. But we're really talking about the names of the Lord, of, of Jesus, the Messiah, and uh, the f more specifically, the four names that Isaiah prophesies about. But it got to me thinking about names and the importance of names um, in, our, in, in our society. We all have names, right? And that's just a common thing among us. We all have names. And uh, our names mean something. And so that's why if you have kids in here, how many of you guys were stressed at all by naming at least your first child? Where it's kind of like, uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of a big deal that we're naming an individual. And, the, and you really have to think through names. That's what I think anyway. Like, because at least in my opinion, I went through every name, proposed name that my wife had come up with because we'd be laying there and after we found out she was pregnant, she'd ask, what do you think about this name? And well, I, and then what do you think about this name? And, eh, you know, and what I would do is uh, I would go through every possible nickname that might be used, right? And so I'd think like, oh man, we can't name that because, the, because kids will end up calling him this. And we can't name him this because then he'll have this nickname. And, and so we go through, because naming, we, want, we don't want our kids to be made fun of, right? At least that was my perspective. Kind of seems like, at least in the celebrity world, like they don't care about that, right? Northwest, you know, uh, Kanye West, they, they name their kids all sorts of weird things. But names are important and names have meanings, especially those names that are like from the Bible, they go all the way back to biblical times, they, they usually have like a Hebrew meaning attached with them. And so if you have a name that was in the Bible, um, it has some sort of Hebrew meaning attached with it because back then they were really big about what names mean. So for instance, uh, Mike or Michael, uh, name means who is like God. Isn't that awesome? Like who is like God? That's what his name means. If your name is John, God is gracious. There you go. God is gracious. Joseph, God will add. Um, Elizabeth, God is my oath. Uh, Paul, little. <laughs> little. You know, some of them are like, God is with me, God is for me, God will fight for me. Paul, little. Uh, Sarah means princess. Everybody got aw, right? Uh, Joanna, God is gracious. My name, growing up, I always heard this. My, if you don't know, I'm minor prophet. Couldn't quite catch into the major prophets, but I'm in the minor prophet category. Uh, but, but my name meant um, God is willing. It's like, okay. But is he going to do it? <laughs> like, that's what I, God is willing. Uh, okay, but... Is he going to do it? Now, when it came to naming our son, like we, we picked out the name. And even before I had met my wife, she'd always want to name a son Caleb Joel. Okay, that's what she, and I love the word name Caleb because if you know anything about the Old Testament, Caleb, then we're, uh, the, in the Bible, he's like this warrior, right? He's like this man of God at 80 years old, just taking on armies and conquering things. And he was just this warrior, right? And so I was like, Caleb, I love that name, Caleb, right? And then we'll spell it with a K just to mess him up for the rest of his life, right? <laughs> Right? Like, so then we, we go up and we're like, well, we should find out what his name means. Like, it's probably something really cool. Like, God is, like, you know, he's a warrior, God's warrior, God's man, like something like that. Faithful dog. <laughs> Faithful dog. That's what his name means. So that's why we say, here, puppy. Here, yep, come on. Uh, no, we don't really do that. <laughs> we will probably end up Need, he will need counseling probably, but um, that may not be from his name. We've been ex we're going to explore, though, bringing up counseling. We're going to explore these four names of Jesus. You see, about 700 years before Jesus was born, God spoke through the prophet Isaiah and prophesied about this coming Messiah, who we know now, like, looking back on history, is Jesus. But from their perspective, perspective they had been waiting for this coming messiah and they wanted to know a little bit more about him 
Now, at this point in the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, there was a time of, uh, it was a tumultuous time in their history. Uh, they had already been divided into two kingdoms. If you know the story, the northern kingdom was called Israel still, and the southern kingdom was called Judah, and there was this battle, the civil war, and they, they split up into these, these kingdoms. And at this point in history, in Isaiah chapter uh, 9, the Assyrian army had already come in and taken over the northern kingdom. They had already been conquered, and so they were living under captivity or just, just the Assyrians came in and set up puppet gods, and, or puppet kings rather, and, and, and were kind of influencing them. And the southern kingdom, although they hadn't been conquered yet, they were in just a tumultuous state. Horrible government, horrible leadership. The kings were awful. Um, they had walked away from the Lord. There was infighting. There was a constant threat of civil war. And so into this tumultuous time, God speaks to his people. Now, although God allowed these things to happen to his people because of their rebellion, God still loved his people. And so he promised them, he, he began saying things like, there's going to be one who comes that's going to bring you back. And so they promised this Messiah that would come. And they thought, when they heard the word Messiah, they thought, okay, this is going to be awesome. He's going to be like, King David of old, he's going to come back, he's going to kick out all the, the bad, he's going to unite the nations again, the, the kingdoms again, and we're going to be one people, we're going to be one, uh, one nation under God, we're going to be one people of God again. They thought he would be born into royalty, born, born into a palace, born into a great standing, a warrior, so that he could come and that he could uh, kick out the Assyrians, eventually the Babylonians, and take over. But we know, even just from the Christmas story, that's not at all how Jesus came, was it? He didn't come in royalty, but rather in humility and in, in a manger. But... Isaiah prophesied, and he, he began using some terminology that got people all excited about who this coming Messiah would be, and he gave four names that would describe this Messiah, who we know know as Jesus. And I think that matters for us today, and I think this series matters for us, that we look back, because I think if we look around us in our, our world, and our culture, we live in tumultuous times, don't we? We live in uneasy times. We live in times where things, people just aren't getting along anymore. The fighting is happening, infighting is happening, uh, political unrest all around us, all in the world, and even in our country, family unrest. Um, whether it's our, our jobs or our relationships or our kids or our marriages, and it just feels like there's a lot of uneasiness and I think the people of God, all the way back when Isaiah was speaking, felt the same thing. They felt an uneasiness around the world they were living in. And Jesus looks into that, or God looks into that and, and speaks these four names. And this is, we need to rem remember that this is who Jesus is at his core. These are not just descriptions of who Jesus is. These are his names. These are him. This is, these are his, who he is as a, at, at his core. So we need these just as much today as they did back then. So uh, Isaiah chapter 9, starting in verse 6, here's we pick up uh, what Isaiah is telling the people. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders. And at this point, I think that the people that are hearing Isaiah saying this, they're getting excited. They're like, oh, yes, the government's going to come back. It's going to be on his shoulders. Like, he's going to bring things back together. And his name shall be called. Let's all read these four together. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Those are the names that Isaiah says will define who this Jesus, this coming Messiah would be. And today and over the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at each of these in more depth. <laughs> but he goes on after this in verse 7. He says, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. 
on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of, the, of, the Lord of hosts will do this. And right here we see this, that, that he will uphold this, that, that his, these will be his names and he will come in righteousness from this time, talking about Isaiah's time, forth and forevermore. We live in that forevermore time. So we're going to look at these names, each of them in depth over the next four weeks together. And today we're going to look at this idea that Jesus is the wonderful counselor. The wonderful counselor. Isaiah calls the Messiah wonderful counselor to indicate the kind of character that this king would come. This idea of wonderful, we throw this word around quite a bit, don't we? It's like anything that we semi-like or that's just kind of pleasant or likable, we say, oh, that's just so wonderful, right? We, a couple weeks ago, right, we sat around tables with a cooked bird in the middle. We're like, that was, that's wonderful, right? That's just a wonderful, oh, look at this wonderful food. Look at this wonderful, and, and some people use this. It's kind of like that word awesome, right? We use, we use that word awesome, and we use the word wonderful like this, anything we kind of like. But we need to understand that when the Bible talks about this idea of wonderful, it literally means incomprehensible. You can't even fathom it. When, he, when Jesus was just called wonderful counselor, it's like you can't even begin to fathom and understand the depth at which Jesus is wonderful. He is, he is full of wonder. Jesus is wonderful in the way that boggles the mind. That's what he was getting at. And we saw that from the very beginning, right? If you know the story of Jesus in the Gospels, that when Jesus was born, he was born to a virgin in a barn. Wonderful, incomprehensible. And then as we watch and see his life and his ministry, and he begins his ministry and, and his teachings, beyond what anybody can understand at that time, they're just wonderful. His miracles, nobody could understand what his miracles were about. They were just too wonderful for, for anybody to even figure out. He was too wonderful. And then he would teach things like, like, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Rejoice and be glad in persecution. Love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. And those kind of statements that were just like, those were groundbreaking and earth-shattering at that time because no one was thinking that way. They were beyond what could be comprehended. The second part of this idea, he's called a wonderful, and then he says counselor. This idea of counselor. In the ancient Israel, a, a counselor was portrayed as a, as a wise king, like Solomon of old. Someone who knew, who had wisdom that was beyond understanding. That was what was thought as a, a counselor. Isaiah would use this uh, idea again, these words together again in Isaiah 28, 29 to describe the Lord. He said, this, all, uh, this also comes from the Lord of hosts. He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. Jesus was a wise counselor. And here's why. Because we come forward into the book of John in the New Testament. Jesus is described this way by John. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. You see, Jesus is the most wonderful counselor because he didn't need any outside information because he knew the hearts and the souls and the minds of men even before he got talking to them. So it kind of brings up this three questions that I want to center this message on today because we hear this idea of wonderful counselor like yeah that's kind of okay that's cool like thanks for the message Joel we'll have a good lunch and we'll see you guys next week um, why does this matter to us why why does this prophecy 700 years before Jesus 2700 years ago spoken into existence why does this even matter to us today and why in the world why in the world do we even need a counselor? And that's kind of the first question I want to center in. Why, why do we need a wonderful counselor? I mean, God gave us brains, right? Some of us are, are really educated. Some of us are not so much. But God gave us all brains to figure things out, to, to understand things, to be able to get, I mean, 
why do we need a counselor? Isn't counselor on, counselors only for like, like sick people and like, like really messed up people, right? That's kind of our mentality. Like isn't counselors for like, you know, it's good for some people, but, but they're kind of messed up, right? And, and they're only for messed up people. I don't need a counselor because, you know, ah, I don't think I need one. And you're right if you think that counselors are only for messed up people. What we fail to understand is that we're all messed up, right? We're all messed up. Uh, in fact, you know, we're like, we're all sick. Every one of us is messed up and sick in some way. And you're like, no, no, Joel, I, I like... I used to be that way. Like, I used to be messed up. But now I kind of got myself together. I, I, I'm doing a little better. I can figure things out on my own. Like, I'm, I'm, not, like, I'm not messed up. I used to be. Now I'm not. Um, no, no, you're messed up. Right? And I'm messed up. And we need to own that. Because, because Jesus came for the messed up. Everyone needs a counselor because everyone is messed up by sin. You see, sin comes in and it has a way in our lives of just messing with us and messing our lives up. It's how we find ourselves in spots in our lives, maybe not on Sunday mornings, but maybe it's in the middle of the week where we sit here, sit in the middle of a mess that we just, and we, if we're, we're brutally honest with ourselves, it's like, how did, I, how did I get here? I'm just, this is messed up. My life's kind of messed up. The thought patterns that I have are messed up. The way I think about other people is messed up. The way I feel about myself, it's, it's not right. It's messed up. The way I treat people or cheat or lie, it, it's, it's messed up. And we need to own that because there was a group of people in the, in the New Testament, they were called Pharisees, and they were the religious leaders of the day, and they didn't think they were messed up anymore. They thought they had it all together and they snubbed their noses at anybody that, that showed that they were messed up. And this is what Jesus said in Luke chapter 5. He said, Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. And we're like, well, yeah, that makes sense. Like, I only go to the doctor when I'm sick. Then he says, Jesus says this, I have come to call not those who, I love this, not those who think they're righteous. Not those who think that they have it all together. Not those who walk, walk around saying, I'm, you know what, I'm pretty great. And I can figure it out, and I've got my life put together, and, and everything in my life's put together. Because Jesus says, no, listen, if you think you're righteous, like if you, if you go around saying, I think I'm righteous, or you walk around with this proud attitude, like I've got it all together, the scariest part is this. Jesus says, I haven't come for you then. You go think you are righteous. You go think, you go do your, your own self-righteous thing and see how that turns out for you. Jesus did not come for those who think that they've got it all together, but rather for those who know that they're sinners and need to repent. Jesus says, I came for those people. And I don't know about you, but I want to be a person that Jesus came for, right? I don't want to be a person that Jesus didn't come for. And so when we walk around thinking that we're righteous and have this self-righteous, proud attitude, like I've, I've got myself put together, Jesus says, you just live your life, then you figure it out yourself and see how that works out for you in the end. But if you, if you want me to be the one who comes for you, to be your righteousness in you, then you need to understand that, that you're sinners and that you need to repent. You see, if left to our own what I've found is if, if I'm left to my own wisdom or lack thereof, I make a mess of my life every time. And chances are, you do too. If, if, if left apart from, a, the, from the wonderful counselor, I just, I consistently make bad choices apart from the wonderful counselor. We need to have a wonderful counselor and Jesus is the very best. And so God, that's what God was telling us through Isaiah. So, okay, we, we understand that we need a counselor, but then how do we know, how can we trust the, the wonderful counselor? How can I trust the wonderful counselor? I mean, he lived like, like so long ago, right? 
how, how, how does he even know? Like, he, doesn't, he wasn't living in the same world that I'm living in. He doesn't understand because he, doesn't, he wasn't living with the same, like, stuff we have here today. Right? Jesus was like so 2,000 years ago. Right? Like so. And he has no idea what I'm going through today. Right? The struggles that I face, I mean, they didn't even have the internet back in 2,000 years ago. So how could he possibly face the temptations I have today? We need to understand that, that although Jesus, yes, he did live long ago, um, that we can trust him because he has experienced everything that we've gone through. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says it this way. For we do not have a high priest, that's Jesus, who is, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. I love that phrase. He's un, who's not able to, uh, who's not unable to empathize with our weaknesses. We had this marriage conference here last night, and if you missed it, you missed out because it was awesome and great information. But um, we learned, he taught us, this guy that was doing the seminar, he taught us the difference between empathy and sympathy. And it was so cool. I hadn't picked up on this before, but, but sympathy and empathy are so different. Symp he gave this illustration. Sympathy is, is, so if you're standing on the shore and there's somebody in the water and they're drowning, sympathy says, okay, I feel bad for them. I'll throw them one of those little floaty things and so they can grab onto it because I feel bad for them. Empathy looks like you diving into the water with them to help bring them and be in the water and help bring them to shore. There's a difference there, right? Between sympathy and, and empathy. And the Bible doesn't say that, Jesus, that, that we don't have a high priest who is able to sympathize. In other words, Jesus, God didn't stand, was up in heaven being like, wow, they are really messing their lives up. Let's throw them a floaty. Let's throw them a life preserver. Let's just see how that works. See if they can handle it on their own. No. What it says is we have a high priest who's, who dove into life with us. He, he, he came from heaven and he dove into the mess of life with us so that he could empathize with our weaknesses. So that he ex experienced what we've experienced. It even says that, right? The very next part. But we have one who has been tempted in every way. Do you realize this, that you have not found a new way to be tempted? You have not discovered a new way to sin that hasn't already been done before. You, you, you don't, and I know this is hard because Satan does a really good job of isolating us in sin and making us feel like you're the only one who's this messed up, and so that's why we don't talk about it, but, but you have not invented a new way to sin. In fact, it's been around for much, much longer than that. No one can ever say, like, man, I've got this sin, and, and no one's ever done it before, and neither with temptation. You see, he has been tempted in every way. Jesus has been tempted in every way. Jesus is starting to look pretty relevant now, isn't he? Because sometimes when he, we're like, well, he lived so long ago, he's not relevant today. When we realize that he's been tempted in every way, that, that he got down into the mess, that, that he experienced the same level of temptation that you and I have experienced, he starts to become a little more relevant. Yet, he did not sin. Yet, he did not sin. He never gave into that temptation. So then he says this, because of that, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Not confidence in ourselves. Not confidence because we're good, but confidence because he's good. And because he was able to empathize, because he knows, because he's relevant, because he understands what we're going through, he, we, can, we can approach his throne with confidence because he knows what you and I are walking through in our weaknesses. You know, we've never, <laughs> you'll never bring a thing to the Lord that he's not heard before or that he has not experienced. You'd be like, Jesus, boy, I'm really struggling with this. You'll never hear Jesus be like, wow, I never heard that one before. <laughs> hey, Michael, Gabriel, come here. 
Have you ever heard of this? I mean, they're pretty screwed up, aren't they? Like, that's, that's pretty bad. Have you ever heard about that before? No, I've never, I've never heard about that, but that's a new way. You'll never hear God do that. You'll never hear Jesus do that. He's able to empathize because he got into life with us and experience the temptation. And so because of that, we can trust him. You know what? It's so much easier to trust somebody who's walked the path that you're walking. Isn't that true? Who's walked along that road, who's lost somebody they love, who's lived that exact same temptation, who's lived that same sin out, who's experienced abuse. When, when you when you find people like that, you, you instantly begin to trust them more, don't you? And we can trust Jesus ultimately because he experienced that so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I love this, mercy and grace. You know what mercy is? Mercy, mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve, whereas grace is getting what we don't deserve. And both of those things are found in our great high priest who understands our weaknesses. And so when we come to him in confidence, in confidence in who he is, in confidence knowing that he understands where we're at, we can find grace and mercy in the midst of our mess because he knows and he understands. So we can trust, we can ultimately trust him the wonderful counselor. So, do you realize your need for a good, good counselor? You didn't know you needed a counselor while walking in here, but that's what I do for you. I just help you realize you're screwed up. Okay, you're welcome. And now you can trust the good counselor. But what do we do with that? How do I, how do I get help from the wonderful counselor? How do I get help? And the first one, you can write this in. Be honest with the counselor. It starts with being honest. Be brutally honest with the good counselor. What good is it to go to a doctor and just tell them how good you feel? Could you imagine that? You go to the, make a doctor's appointment and you know how hard those are to get these days. And uh, you go to the doctor and you sit down and you're like, Lord, or are you like, doctor, you know, I'm just feeling pretty good. You know, my leg used to hurt. My knee used to hurt. It's feeling great now. And you know, I was having that back problem we, we, we talked about, but you know what? That's doing great now, too. Your doctor would eventually, after you just kept telling him how good you feel, he'd be like, then why are you here? Right? Like, why'd you come? Oh, I just wanted to, I just wanted to inform you of how good I feel. They'd be like, what? Well, that doesn't make any sense. Right? He'd be like, no, you have to have... Why are you here? And, and sometimes, even though we do have things wrong with us, sometimes when we come to God in prayer, we begin to tell him how good we feel. We start out telling him how great things are going. And we never get to the brutal honesty of what's really happening in our lives. The areas of real struggle, the areas of real weakness, the areas of sin and temptation. Bring those to the Lord. Bring those painfully honest things to God. You will not shock God. You're not going to surprise him like we talked about before. He already knows. Tell him how everything you feel, everything you struggle with, every stronghold that has a part of you, everything you're concerned with, everything that's causing you to stay up at night, bring those before the good counselor, the wonderful counselor. He wants to hear from you. And be honest. One day Jesus was walking and he came up to a well and he met this woman, this Samaritan woman who had a lot of problems in her life. And they began this interaction and they were talking about water for a little while and exchanging about water. And eventually Jesus asked her a question that went to the most painful, most raw place in her life. And he asked this, he says, he said to her, Go call your husband to come here. And this woman, we'll find out in a moment, she had had a pretty bad experience with men in her life. In fact, she had been married five times. 
says, the woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus says to her, you're right in saying that you have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. And then Jesus says this, which is so interesting. He says this, what you have said is true. He asks, go get your husband. She could have lied. She'd be like, oh, he's, he's busy at work. Oh, he, you know what? Because by this point, she already knew that he was this prophet, right? He was a man of God. And so she could have lied, covered it up, figured it out. But she says, you know what? I'm going to tell you the truth. I have no husband. And, and Jesus sees into her. And, and what the coolest interaction out of all this is, is that she may have been one of the first people to ever, for Jesus to ever reveal himself as the one, the Messiah who, that had come into the world, to this Samaritan woman because she was willing to be honest with him. You see, you can fool a lot of people a lot of time. You can fool me a lot of the time. But we can't fool Jesus. We can't fool him. So why do we try to hide? Why do we, why do we try to hide our sins from him? We need to be honest with the counselor before we can begin do, getting any help from him. The second thing is this. We need to listen, listen to the counselor. Friends, after we've been honest with the counselor, we need to listen to what he's telling us. We need to listen to Jesus. Seems like today, um, we have no shortage of counselors in the world that we live in today. Everybody that has a Facebook account thinks they're a counselor, right? I mean, anytime you get on there, everybody wants to give your, their opinions. Everybody wants to shit. Everybody, you know, I, my, I can have the best ideas. You need to follow this. Here's what I do. Here's what I think. Here's my opinion. Everybody's in it for sharing opinions. We have no shortage of people counseling other people today, right? Athletes, um, uh, news people, uh, radio hosts, um, celebrities, everybody's looking to give their input and their counsel into any and every situation that's out there. And you realize this, that, that and this is not right or wrong, it just kind of is, that whoever you listen to and place value on what they say is one of your counselors. Whoever you are listening to, whether that's the radio or uh, like YouTube, uh, somebody on YouTube or on Facebook or on the news or the newspaper, those don't exist anymore. Let's go back to that. Um, uh, the, the celebrity, whoever it is that you are listening to and valuing their opinion is one of your counselors. And that's not necessarily bad. Like there's a lot of good, people out there. There's a lot of people that are giving good advice, right? So that's not necessarily even a bad thing. But we just got to recognize the fact that we are constantly getting information. We're constantly listening to, and it's important who it is that we're listening to. But too often we run into counselors in the world that would give advice that's counter to what the wonderful counselor would tell you that just wants to share their opinion on their thoughts, what they've experienced. And, and some of that may not be bad, but that pales in comparison to how good the wonderful counselor's advice can be. We need to begin paying more attention to what Jesus is saying and the truth that he's trying to give to us. When Jesus came and he was up on the Mount, Tra Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, Mark records this, that the, a cloud overshadowed them and a voice came from the cloud and said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. He was telling Peter, James, and John, hey, this is my son. This is my beloved son. This is Jesus. You need to listen to him. You need to hear him. Not, not just not just hear what he has to say, but actually listen to him. He's credible. He's relevant. He knows. He's the very best option for what we got going on. And I just, I just feel like, even in my own life, I look sometimes to, to everywhere else for advice. And my last option becomes the wonderful counselor. 
I'm like, okay, I've, I, I've exhausted every other resource that I have. I guess now I'll pray about it. Or I guess now I'll go to God's word about it. Or I guess then now I'll go talk to somebody who has some godly counsel on it. But really, we need to short circuit that. Rather than just going on social media and asking your question there first, or going to a self-help book to find your answers there first, come to Jesus, the wonderful counselor, the one who knows right where you're at and knows how to direct you in your life. So how do we listen to him? I think one of the primary ways is through God's word. We need to be people who are in God's word because in this book, he's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. I love that statement, that verse, that, that everything pertaining to life and godliness, both of those things, when we're in the mess of life, we need life and godliness are found in, in the scriptures. And we need to know these and we need to get into that. We need to turn to them when we're in times of need. We need to turn to them in moments of weakness to find help for our times of need. The second is this, listening prayer. I found that we, we like to talk a lot in prayer. We, we share a lot in prayer. But it's not often that we just stop talking and listen that we just sit back and listen for what God's answer is. We spend so much talk, time talking that we never let God have a moment in Edra. He, we, even if he was trying to talk to us, we probably couldn't hear over all the talking we're doing. So we need to have moments in our life, in our prayer life, where we are done talking for a while and we listen for what God's trying to direct us to do because God does want to move and direct. And may, it may not be this audible voice that you can hear, but I believe the Spirit of God moves and, and gives us direction when we begin to listen to him. There's a cool moment. I, I just was reminded about this a couple weeks ago. Um, there's a little girl that used to be here in our church and uh, she just turned four and it kind of sparked my memory of this because it was such, I'll never forget this. Um, her parents, this little girl's parents are some of our dearest friends and uh, and during, we, we were celebrating their, their, their uh, expected uh, baby and, and we were getting really excited and she was progressing on and progressing on and um, you know how babies are, they're really unexpected with when they come and uh, so it's, you can't really plan it. And uh, I remember one night I was laying in bed and, uh, and I was asleep and God woke me up out of a dead sleep and he brought... And so, and, you know, I was like, this is weird. And I heard him say, you need to pray for this, this lady. Just pray for her right now. And so I got to spend a little bit of time praying for, for them. And I didn't even know what, anything was going on. So the next morning comes and I get a text that, that the baby had just been born the night before. So we were celebrating. I was like, that's so cool that God allowed me to pray right when this baby was being born. I later found out that she had some complications during that, that birth and that she was just bleeding and bleeding and they couldn't get it to stop. And at the moment, God woke me up and said, you start praying. She was in the middle of fighting for her life. And she made it through. And just a few days ago when that thing on Facebook said, oh, this little girl's turning four, I was just remembering and praising God that he woke me up out of a dead sleep and then he, that, that, that I was able, because sometimes I'm, I don't listen real well. Sometimes I just start talking. Um, that, he, that I was listening enough for him to say, start praying now. And you just keep going. Because God wants to speak in and through us. And I think just sometimes because of the noise of life, we just don't listen. And we miss out on God speaking to us, the wonderful counselor pouring into our lives because we don't stop with the noise. I want to challenge you as you begin to listen to the good counselor, you need to find time in your prayer life to just stop talking, turn off the radio, turn off the TV, find somewhere to hide from your children. Uh, no, um, find a moment where you can be quiet and just listen to the Lord. And the third thing, the third way I think God speaks to us that we, we would be wise to listen is through godly people. 
people who understand God's word, who will bring in God's advice into the situation. I didn't say good people for a reason. There's a lot of good people that are willing to give advice. I say godly people, people who know the scriptures, people when you say, man, I've been really struggling with this, I've been really battling with this, they say, you know what God's word says? God's wisdom says this. God, they they bring this element in of God's word into it. You see, we can share our advice all day long and it's all out here and it's all somebody else's opinion. When we bring God's word into the situation, it brings the final authority on the situation. And so you need to begin to have people in your life and add people into your life that can give you godly advice. Find people who can pour into you and, and, and just kind of a side note, kind of a side thing, I believe that there are times with and there's certain things going on in our lives where we do need to seek out professional counseling, but here's what I'll say about that. Find a counselor that's a godly Christian counselor who brings godly advice into the situation. Don't just go to whoever has the most PhDs behind their name most abbreviations behind their name. Find somebody who knows God's word and can bring God's word into the situation because that's where the real power lies because they're tapping into not just their own opinions, but they're tapping into the wonderful counselor's opinions and that's what really matters. And the, th- the third step in this is this. Uh, how do we get help? Obey the, command, uh, obey the counselor. Obey the counselor. Knowing the right thing to do will not change your life. Knowing the right thing to do will not change your life. I'll say it again. Knowing the right thing to do will not change your life. You need to be honest and listen, and then you need to obey and do what the counselor says. Jesus talked about this in Luke chapter 6, and you can just sense his frustration when he says this, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? I think every parent's had this conversation. Why do you call me Daddy, Daddy, and not do what I say? Jesus is frustrated here. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? He's telling me, why are you, why are you coming? Why are you calling me Lord, and you're not doing? And then he gives this little parable. He says, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood rose and the stream broke against the house and could not shake it because it had been well built, but the one who hears and does not do them is like the man who built his house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. He's saying, listen, when you when you know what you need to do, when you come to God's word and you hear what you need to do, you need to put it into practice in your life. When we come here and we hear messages out of his word, we need to put them in practice in our life. When we hear godly people say, you know what, this is what God's word says, we need to begin to obey those things. When we hear from the Lord, we need to put them into our lives or else we're just like this guy who just slaps up his house with pallets on, on sand and whenever, the, whenever life comes, it just flattens them. You, you know people like this, Right? who just, in life, it seems like whatever little storm comes up, whatever little thing comes up, it just flattens them. It just, everything in life just, they're destroyed by the smallest storm. I hope you know people who are grounded in God's word and have watched them walk through storms of life because it's special to watch. It's special to watch people who are grounded in God walk through storms of life because although the storm rages on and the stream is breaking against them and everything in life is pounding down on them, they are able to stand firm because they they have their foundation set in the rock that is Jesus, the rock that is the wonderful counselor, and they're living that out. The apostle, uh, James says it this way, similar thing, But don't just listen to God's word. 
You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourself. For if you listen to the word and do not obey, you are like glancing at your face in the mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you have heard, then God will bless you for doing it. So he gives this silly illustration, right, of walking up and looking at a mirror and, and seeing like, oh, there's some work. Like much of us, many of us this morning, like look in the mirror like, ooh, there's some work to do, right? We got, some, got something to do. And then walking away from the mirror and being like, you know what? I don't have any. I don't even need to comb my hair. I'm looking great, right? I'm just going to go like this. And you walk in and everybody's like, you should have looked in the mirror, right? <laughs> no, we don't do that, right? We, we look in the mirror and then we're, we're like, oh, okay, we look into it and then we're like, I got to fix that. And then we go about fixing, right? He's saying, listen, if when we look into God's perfect law, it's like looking in a, into a mirror and we're seeing ourselves and we're seeing our shortcomings and we get, begin to put into practice what we're learning. These are these ideas, these metaphors that, that the Bible points out that we need to act on them. And he says this, I love this, then God will bless you for doing it. See, God's blessing in our life is not merely attached to listening. It's attached to doing. Blessing in life is not attached to just having the information in your head. The blessing in life comes when you begin to take that information and you begin to put it into practice in your life. So let me just ask you a series of three questions as we wrap up here to just kind of get us thinking about our own lives and how this, how Jesus, the wonderful counselor, can we can allow him to become a part of our lives and speak into our lives even more than he does now. So let me ask you, what area of your life do you need to begin to be honest with the wonderful counselor? Think about that for a moment. What area of your life do you need to begin to be honest? You've been hiding. You've been putting on a good front. You've been fooling everybody else. But where do you need to start being honest with God? Second question is this. How do you need to practice listening this week? How do you need to practice? So for some of you, it may look be like getting in God's word and, and just listening to what he's speaking to you as you read. For some of you, it may be finding some quiet time to just begin practicing listening and stop talking and just listening. And for some of you, you're facing some pretty big things. You're facing some pretty big problems and you need to find some godly people, possibly even a godly counselor begin walking and helping you walk through the mess. How do you need to practice listening this week? And the third question is this. Are you willing to obey the Lord no matter what that means? No matter what that means for you, are you willing to begin to obey what he says? It may mean giving up some stuff. It may mean laying some things down. Not being able to go to those places or do those things. Maybe it means seeking out help for your marriage or for your, for your life, for your addictions. Are you willing to obey the Lord no matter what it takes? And I think really when we begin to answer those three questions, we begin to allow the wonderful counselor to truly come in and start being wonderful in our life, to being uncomprehensible, the work that he can begin to do in the life, in the heart of somebody whose life is surrendered to him. I want you to grab those three questions, take them home, think through them this, this, uh, today and, and this week, and just begin to answer those honestly.